everybody. Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me as always are my fabulous co-hosts. Hey, Rob, it's Diana. And it's me, a friend, Jackie. Oh, man. I, is everyone else tired? I am, I'm really tired. I'm, I'm not. I'm not tired. I think I'm summer fine. is summer is starting to drain, I love drain my energy with all its hot heat. It's I, hot heat. It's hot, hot, hot heat. heat. I hung out in a pool all day today. Did not get out at all for even a second. Wow. I ate lunch in the pool. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> it was gross, Soggy. but amazing. It's kind of gross. awesome. Yep, because it was hot. It's too hot. It's real hot. It's real hot here. But you know how to beat the summer heat? <laughs> Why well, would behavior analysis oh, God. and behavior analytic research, of course. Every week here at ABA Smooth. Inside Track. You like that as a segue? That's the segue you're going to get. That's about how tired I am. I can't come up with a better one. Every week here at ABA Inside Track, we pick a topic in the field of behavior analysis, some related research articles, and we discuss. This week, though, it's a little bit different in that we'll be doing our grab bag. That's the grab bag song. I just wrote I it. I like that. Was it good? Mm-hmm. That was a real horn mm-hmm. I was playing. It was not my mouth mm-hmm. in the shape of a horn. Mm-hmm. So for grab bag episodes, folks at home, if you're new to them, every 12 episodes of the show, rather than pick one topic like functional communication training or uh, other topics we've done. We've done a lot of prompting. Man, we've done a lot of episodes and I can only think of you one. You only thought of one. <laughs> Instead of that. We just all reached into our giant grab bag of every article ever written. We printed them all out. Not the same one as last time. We threw that away. We had to print them all out again. And then we grab in and we pick one article each. So they are not going to be around a central theme. Or maybe they will be. Who knows? They're grab bag articles. And we each take a turn discussing them. This week, we'll be doing that same thing. We're going to talk about three articles, one each. All right? Since I feel like I usually go last on grab bag episodes, I asked if I could go first this time and you guys said sure i said omg yeah rob i like really want you to go first oh thank you so much okay great so i'll go first so here we go i'm gonna reach into the giant article grab bag and i'm gonna pull out an article here we go i'm reaching in it's a loud bag oh my goodness this one oh that article feels feels too short too wet that article is too long and wet. Ew. Ah, here's one. Looks like it's just right for me. I'll tell you what it is. Are you ready? I'm mm-hmm. ready. I'm ready. I'm going to be talking about an article called Reducing Adolescent Cell Phone Usage Using an Interdependent Group Contingency. And that is by Jones, Alday, and Givens from the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis 2019. So that's what I'll be talking about. That's very recent. That's just in the spring issue of Java. Oh, my. This is like a topic for the times, you know? Yes. These cell phones. Kids with their flip phones. And they're flipping. What do they do with these phones? No, that tells you. they move past those now, Rob. They don't have flip phones anymore. <gasps> or Blackberries anymore. What? What do they do? They have these things called smartphones. What do they do? They, like... they do everything. They're like wow. having a mini computer in your pocket. <gasps> Sounds amazing. Right. So you can access the internet through them. You can also access social media through them. And many of those things they are finding are actually kind of addicting. Are they now? Mm-hmm. So it's like vaping. They vape their phones? Is that what they do with the vaping? Uh, no. Those you are two different problems. Oh. Yeah. There are problems, though. Yeah. You should check out. We have put a recent article on our Facebook um, about addiction and cell phones. Check out our phone. Open up your smartphone. (laughs) Open up your smartphone and read the article about addicting smartphones on your smartphone. No. That sounds like a trick. It's like don't feed your gremlin after midnight kind of trick. All right. So let me read this article and you guys just wait there a minute and I'll read it and then I'll tell you all about it. Here we go. I can't wait. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna edit, I edit out the part where I You're made back. everyone watch me read. <laughs> and he went, hmm, ha, huh, interesting. Yeah, I cut that part out. Now it's just the part where I'm going to discuss the article. So as Jackie and Diana were talking about, cell phones are pretty darn ubiquitous nowadays in every aspect of our lives. So why the heck wouldn't it be in upper schools, middle school, high school? This article specifically is talking about high school. And while I think we can all name a bunch of positives of cell phone use, we can probably also all name a bunch of negatives of increased cell phone use. So I'm going to start with the positives, all right? Some of the positives. And some of these are from the Jones article. Some of these are ones I just 
thought of myself. So certainly there are lots of educational apps available out right now. So a teacher could technically use students' cell phones to have them do work. There are all sorts of polling apps, you know, Mentimeter, all sorts of ways to do kind of straw polls. You can do quizzes like Quizlet, all sorts of apps to do work on one's phone. There are testing apps that allow for instant scoring of tests, which save teacher time and also allow for immediate feedback for students, which I know a lot of students would appreciate. Because, uh, you know, what do we all hate about our classes when we go to class, we work really hard and, oh, here's the final. It's 50 percent of your grade. And if you screw up in this one thing, you might as well have not bothered coming to class kind of thing. Nobody likes that. You also can look at, say, uh, do behavior programs on an app. Well, there are lots of ways you can do, you know, picture activity schedules. You can do to-do lists, calendars, timers. They even used a timer in this study. Uh, so they used a smartphone in the study about reducing smartphone use. You can mm. make lists. There's all sorts of ways to do communication, which is kind of a con, but could also be a positive. You could have a group, and if your student is absent, why they could still actually take part in a group discussion or a group activity. These are all positives. Even when we talked about, say, um, interteach as a program, you know, that wasn't necessarily something that one did on a phone. However, you could probably do something along those lines using phone technology. So a lot of positives to using a phone. A lot of cons, unfortunately, especially at middle school, middle school and high school level. So the direct access to the internet makes it a lot easier to cheat on tests. It probably makes it a lot easier to plagiarize because how quickly can you say, let me Google something related to that, and then I will just read word for word what I found on my phone in front of me, and I don't realize it's plagiarism because it's on a phone, not in an encyclopedia or in a textbook, right? What's Certain an encyclopedia? Oh, uh, no. Certainly, Isn't cer that person, Encyclopedia Brown? It's like, yeah, you, you text Encyclopedia Brown and you say, I've got this lame-ass mystery I need you to solve for me. And he's like, mm, the Earth's rotation is the answer. <laughs> and we're all better for knowing that. Socializing, I think, is the con that most comes to mind when we talk about cell phone use in schools. We have kids who are texting their friends. You could also engage in cyberbullying pretty easily. It's like, I never touched that kid. I never said anything to his face yeah. about him, but That's a real I problem. posted a bunch of stuff on social media. Yeah. I think all of us would say that socializing through phone in school is we would consider it wasting time because we're old people. Kids might not think that, but they're wrong, those kids. I think one of the other problems that would lead to academic disruption is the immediacy of the cell phone. If your friend sends you a message, well, it used to be, oh, I got this letter from a friend. I'll have to find them or send them a letter back later when I have time. Whereas now if a friend sends you something, it is really hard to make the case of, oh, I'll have to get back to my friend later. No, I got to do it right now. It's right in front of me. And we all expect instant communication that way. So that can be a real disruption to the academic classroom. Uh, so aren't there rules about not having phones in schools? Oh, you would think so. But as Jones points out, a lot of schools don't actually have very clear cell phone policies if they have a cell phone policy at all. They're also pretty varied from school to school. And I'll be honest, be working in a lot of different schools over the years, I can tell you that the cell phone policies that do exist are not always carried out as consistently as one would hope, mm. given a rule. So I don't think it's very surprising that a lot of students might think they can do whatever they want related to their cell phone. Plus, a lot of kids are using their cell phones in ways that are kind of disruptive. But you know what? When it's time to buckle down and do your work, they put the phone away, which leaves kids who have a harder time, say, maybe with conduct in a classroom, understanding when it is and is not time to use a phone. Children with disabilities might not pick up on, say, the social cues. I don't know this for, for, for a fact or through research. It's just uh, or things that I could assume might happen if every one sort of uses a cell phone at different times. The Jones article cites a study by Thomas et al. from 2011 that stated that 80% or actually more than 80% of high school students text daily with half of those reporting that they text hourly. Uh, there are a lot of other studies that were discussed in which 64% uh, of teenagers say reported that they texted during class, even if they're not supposed to text during class. Who are class. they texting? They're friends. I mean, but probably. But their friends are also in class. Well, I mean, again, I think there's a difficulty with schools not having consistent policies, schools that do have a policy about cell phone use, not necessarily following the policy. And I mean, when you think about it, for some teachers, you probably are seeing kids who are like, I'm addicted to my phone. You can't take my phone. I'm sure there are teachers out there who've taken kids' phones because they broke the policy and have gotten a nasty letter from a parent mm -hmm. or have been called the next day. How dare you take my child's phone? They need their phone. What if there's an emergency? So I'm getting I'm, – I'm thinking it's in almost everyone's – Probably direct reinforcement is to just say, I don't care. I'm just going to ignore it. And for the most part, kids probably put the phone away when it's time to put it away. So I think the cell phone policy is mostly, if you don't bother me with your cell phone in my classroom, I'm just going to let it go. Yeah. However, what we then don't know is how much does that impact students learning? Right. One it time I saw on Pinterest this really cute thing where they had like a shoe uh, over the 
door shoe holder Mm -hmm. and it had different colors and like kids names in it and then they put their phones in there when they came in the classroom oh that's smart isn't that super smart and clever and cute like just everybody like here's where you put your phone and then if it rings we can hear it yeah (laughs) right like if it's emergency we can hear it and see it yeah but it's not at the desk. I like love that. Yeah, I think that that's a that's a nice policy. I'm sure the teacher had to you know had to plan it out because they had to get the props together, right. and the students seem to be following it. I should do that for my office. Just have one little shoe, <laughs> fold, shoe holder. <laughs> oh, there's Jackie's phone. That's where her goes. <laughs> In this research article, Jones and colleagues decided to look at well, what if we put a policy about cell phones in place, and not just a policy, but what if we used group contingencies to try to minimize the use of cell phone use. And as you'll find out in this study, pretty much try to completely remove cell phone use during academic time. Now, we all know group contingencies, but for those of you who might be new to group contingencies, I'll do a very quick review. Basically, a group contingency is just a situation in which there is a clear consequence that is either stated or written or discussed that will occur for more than one individual if a certain rule uh, is followed or or in some cases is not followed, you know, depending on whatever the rule is. We've talked about a couple different ones in various articles. So, for example, the good behavior game is an example of an interdependent group contingency, basically one in which everybody in the group has to meet some sort of a criteria to earn whatever the reinforcer is or, or to have whatever the consequences are occur. There's also, say, an independent group contingency, which pretty much just means anyone who meets a criteria can you know, earn whatever the reward is. So, you know, you, you think about a test, you know, oh, everyone get a sticker if they get an 80 or above technically kind of meets the criteria of an independent group contingency. Not a very good one, but, you know, anyone who gets an 80, you get a yeah, sticker. that's what it is. And then also a dependent group contingency. I, just, I don't think we've talked too much about it, but that's really a situation in which you have sort of a target individual within a group. And if that individual meets the criteria, criteria then everyone in that group wins. Um, you'll see this, say, uh, called like the hero game, or you'll see this mm-hmm. sometimes with students where you pick uh, the student who, who, who is engaging in the target behavior the most. You might make them the target over and over again, but you're supposed to kind of switch up the groups. But if you have a few students who kind of need a behavior plan, but you don't want to make the, an individualized plan, you can run a group contingency because it benefits everybody in the classroom. A lot of research on the subject of group contingencies, some of them in previous episodes that we've done. So, hey, Jones and colleagues said, I bet this will work because all the other research on group contingencies has worked. Why wouldn't this one? A lot of reasons it might or might not work, but let's find out what happened. Some examples where group contingencies have been used. So increasing academic engagement, decreasing disruptive behavior in a classroom. We've also seen some group contingencies. Uh, I think we discussed it on the last, might have been the last grab bag or two grab bags ago, looking at group contingencies, increasing pro-social statements or social statements of peers. And there even was a meta-analysis that's re- uh, referred to in this article in which studies looked at that used group contingency designs found up to two standard deviation reduction in rates of disruptive behavior from baseline levels. The citation they gave was Megan et al., 2017. For this study, the primary author also served as the teacher who implemented the group contingency design. We had six students in a school for students, it was an alternative high school. It was a school for students who had special learning and or behavioral needs. They were at high risk of dropping out of high school altogether. There were three males and three females. There were four Caucasian students and two African-American students, which is a much more diverse group than I usually <laughs> see in a lot of school designs. A lot, a lot of uh, research done in schools, which was nice. One student had an IEP for emotional and behavioral disorders. Two students had 504 plans. So again, pretty diverse group of learners in that regard. The school itself did not have a set cell phone policy in place at the time of the study. However, teachers were complaining about an excessive use of cell phones by the students during class time. The teacher, again, like I said, also the first author, was a teacher with five years of experience uh, as a certified teacher. So let's talk about the data systems. We really have two kind of data points that are being reviewed or two sets of data that are being collected throughout one was an in one individual student who engaged in the most cell phone use. The author looked at specific minutes of cell phone use of that one student. This is poor Veronica. Do you think they looked at the screen time part on like their iPad? That part oh, where it's like screen time. They did not mention it at oh, all. And that I believe a is a feature. recent update. So I don't oh, know okay. if that was possible to yeah. do. I mean, there might have been apps that did that, but they didn't mention anything. They I mean okay. they they pretty much just set a timer. The teacher had an app, and whenever the student 
you know, met the definition for cell phone usage, started the timer, and then when they put when the girl put the cell phone in her purse or in her pocket or put it on her desk with the screen off, ended the timer and sort of did that for a number of classes. Um, she observed a number of classes, a bunch of the students, and picked Veronica, who had the most cell phone use of all. So she kind of served as the exemplar of minutes of cell phone use in the classroom. They also used partial interval sampling to look at the percentage of students who were using cell phone use. I'm not quite sure why they use percentage interval, because as I was reading the article, it really seemed like they had one interval in their partial interval, which was the entire class. <laughs> the longest interval so ever. So I couldn't, I couldn't quite tell if that's what they meant or if that was just part. But they never said an interval other than the 90 minutes of the class. Hmm. Again, why partial interval? I feel like you could have just done anything else, but that's what they used. So those were really the data points that were used throughout the study. So what was the whole class doing percentage-wise? Did they use their phones at all? Kind of yes, no was pretty much what it came down to. And how many minutes did this one student, Veronica, use her cell phone? And they that was sort of your sample kid. Sure. This all occurred during an elective class, photography, which was a 90-minute class, as I are, has, had already said. They met three times a week. One of the questions I have, and Megan Jones, if you are listening to this, please write in. Are you both a certified teacher, someone who does work in uh, emotional behavioral research, behavior analysis, and a photography teacher? If so, I do want to know because it did <laughs> seem like a very, very specific Venn diagram of skill set. So very cool if you are. But please, we re I really want to know. I, I was kind of left wondering if you were mostly a photography teacher who ended up doing research after the fact, which would be really cool. So an operational definition of cell phone use, which is, man, I would hate to have written the operational definition for cell phone use. Here's the one that the researchers came up with. Touching or swiping a screen to activate it, looking at or continuing to manipulate the screen at any point, using two hands to manipulate the phone, which pretty much would probably always mean texting or screwing around on the internet, I suppose, was scored as student cell phone use. Could it be didn't playing a... Candy Crush. You could be playing Candy Crush, yeah. Did not count if the student just pressed a button to make the clock appear. You know, like, all right. What time is it? Ugh. Yeah, nobody uses a watch anymore, Bubble I guess. Bubble Blast. Bubble Blast. Is that a game? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I don't know any of the games. <laughs> yeah, I played Dr. Mario the other day. That was pretty fun. Is that like the one with the Tetris pills? It's like Tetris, but it's slightly different than Tetris. You like match colors instead of trying mm -hmm. to make the lines. But yeah, it was fun. It was free. So it was nice. And this just occurred during the class. There was the teacher taking data. There was a secondary observer who measured the class-wide cell phone use. Again, using 90-minute partial interval recording. But then it sounded like the interval was 90 minutes long. So, And partial interval, too. Really easy data right. system of like, Did they do it? there we go. There we go. Right. Plus, plus. But maybe that's that's useful if the teacher's taking all the data, right? And there's like, yeah. That's yeah. Right, that makes sense. And the authors mentioned that, that yeah. it was kind of what could be used at the time. But they were also able to take data on Veronica's minute-by-minute -minute cell phone use. So, yeah, I don't know. The study used a reversal design. It was an ABAB design and took data on 29 consecutive class meetings. There were never more than two students out at a time, which, again, when we're looking at percentage of use, can actually change your percentages quite a bit. But, again, didn't happen too, too often. Most of the kids were, were there a lot of the time. Data began after the tardy bell had rung, and it either ended when the bell rang again to end the class, or 10 minutes before the end of class if the students met the criteria to earn a reinforcement block of time. Cool. Yep. Yeah. So in baseline, really nothing changed. There was no addressing of cell phone policy. The kids could use the phones, not use the phones, whatever. And there was no real response to whether the students were or were not using the phone. When they did the return to baseline, they just pretty much said, oh, we're not doing that contingency anymore. We're just not doing that anymore as the return to baseline. When they began intervention, the teacher explained pretty much what the group contingency was going to be. That the students could earn 10 minutes of uninterrupted cell phone use if nobody used their phone during class. If any of the students used their phone, the whole class did not earn that uninterrupted cell phone time. Which, again, reading that, I said, that sounds crazy. Because these kids, it, as we talk about the baseline rates, seem to be using their phone a lot. So to immediately say, you can't use it at all, not a single one of you, that really sounded like a recipe for failure. I thought they'd be like, oh, you have to use it 50% less than you're currently using it. But it was, nope, can't use the phone. If so, they reminded the class of this every day. And then again, when 10 minutes left in class, if they'd met the criteria, hey, great job, everybody. You can use your phones and talk to each other. It, it just said talk. I don't know if that meant they could call people on the phones or just talk to each other uh, while like, they were okay. using their phones. I, I didn't, it didn't specify. Just use their phones and talk. Whatever that means. Chat. Yeah. Chit chat. That's what I assumed it was. But we again. You used to get to play cards. Whoa. At the end of class. On your phones? Cards on your phones? Yeah, Rob. No, we didn't have phones. Oh, my goodness. 
How did I you know, live? I'm such a dinosaur. How did you survive? <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I used to have to pick up the phone. I picked up the mouthpiece in one hand uh, and the earpiece in the other hand. And I go, operator, connect me to. And I just say the name. And they, they got me. Right, too. It's amazing. One moment, please. <laughs> I'll connect you. <laughs> Did you know that there was a, at one point with phone technology before hello was decided upon as the phrase we would say when someone calls us, uh, there was a real push. I believe it was Alexander Graham Bell wanted it to be ahoy ahoy or ahoy ahoy as the original way to oh, say yeah? hello. Which if you watch The Simpsons, oh, you'll know. Why- Montgomery Burns says ahoy ahoy. Yep, that's why that's why Montgomery Burns says ahoy ahoy because he's it's implied he's so old he would have known what people said on the phone when it was first invented. Oh, nice. My grandmother said eh, hello, <laughs> just like that every time. It was very endearing. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't finish my contingency. Anyone used the phone? They got told nope, cell phones were used during class, so we will continue class as normal today. And then that ten minutes was just spent cleaning up, teaching a class like normal. Uh, there was treatment fidelity on whether the correct contingency was presented at the end. So did they use the phones and then get the reward, which they shouldn't have? Or did they not get the reward when they were supposed to get the reward? Uh, was the data? And then if they gave instructions at the beginning of class. Not a lot of procedural integrity data there. But again, it's in a classroom. So maybe they weren't able to take too too, too much in terms of their procedure. And then finally, at the end of the assessment, there was a social validity questionnaire. And I'll tell you about that at the end of the study. But let's get into the results. So... Looking at our baseline, talking about Veronica's total duration of cell phone usage per class. And we'll also be talking again as the percentage of cell phone usage for the whole class, of which are only six kids. So you only had so many percentages. It could be from zero to 100. So in baseline, Veronica used her cell phone an average of 21.2 minutes per class. Veronica. With a range of 7.5 minutes to 41 minutes. Wow, Veronica. I During Checked class out. time. Checked out, she Veronica. did not care Yikes. about photography. The average percentage of cell phone use across all of the students, though, was 88%. And that was 75 to 100%. So pretty much everyone was using their phone at least once oh my gosh. during every single class period. Yeah. Here's the funny part, though. Those rates sound like really high. So I'm thinking this contingency either is going to fail miserably or show a modest decrease in cell phone use. Shockingly, the group contingency was introduced. The mean total duration of cell phone use fell for Veronica to 0.95 minutes per class. And that was a range of 0 to 5.6 minutes. And in... Wow. Um, it's yeah. 57 seconds. Yeah, so very little cell phone usage almost immediately. And out of four out of seven of Veronica's data points, didn't use a cell phone at all. Hmm. Which sounds like it must be really hard for her because she could use it for 40 minutes on certain classes. She was sweating by the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Having withdrawal symptoms. <laughs> apparently, apparently not. The group percentage was 16.5%. So zero to 50%. And in 50% of sessions, nobody used their phone at all. Wow, cool. So a huge decrease. When they returned to baseline, oh boy, did <laughs> cell phone usage come back with a vengeance. Veronica's duration immediately increased to a mean of 39.2 minutes per class, oh which is 24.3 minutes on the low end to 60.8 minutes of class. Holy moly. Is this when they're just like waiting for their film to develop or something? I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> they're just sitting there like looking at pictures. It's in the dark. You know, looking at pictures on their phone related to class. Who knows? The teacher's like, I'm telling you something very important. They're like, hmm. Yeah. Shutter scrolling. speeds or zoom lenses. You see me scrolling. <laughs> I'm scrolling. I'm striping right, righty, yeah. I'm swiping lefty, yeah. Is that a song? I just made it up. You just made that song up? It was a rap song. That was good. That's like a Weird Al version. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was uh, singing it about myself. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you. Finally, the students went back to using cell phone usage. Every single student used their cell phone every single class, 100%. They came back with a vengeance. Did the cell instructions phone change? Like, they now just, it's fine to use your phone or just, they just oh, said, we're, not oh we're, doing... not doing, we're not doing that thing anymore. Okay. You're not earning the time anymore. Okay. It's just not happening anymore. They re-implemented the group contingency. And then fortunately, the kids didn't say, I'm wise to your tricks, teacher. I don't care. They went even lower in terms of the percentage of kids who were using cell phone. Veronica's total amount of time dropped to an average of 0.06 minutes. So Veronica really was just giving up that cell phone use. Zero percentage of kids who used the cell phones in six out of seven sessions. Uh, one time they failed, and it was Veronica who used her phone. But again, let's not jump on poor Veronica, because she was using the phone for like two seconds. You know, she barely used her phone at all. Her mom called. I was just going to say, so I had to check to make sure it wasn't her mom yeah. calling. <laughs> 
like I said, you hear these great results. So cell phone use definitely was reduced when this group contingency was in place. Researchers also did a social validity questionnaire with the kids. Now, I didn't love how they did the questionnaire because it was three questions, which again, that's fine. But they did it as a group discussion at the end of the whole intervention, mm -hmm. meaning they asked the, each question and then allowed all of the kids to talk about their answers and then transcribe the results, which I think is going to put a lot of, sort of peer pressure in place and not necessarily get, I mean, we're talking about subjective measures, even more subjective measures than you would have had otherwise. So there were three questions. They were, what did you think about not use, having your phones during class time? Did you feel that you could focus better during class without your phones? And what was your reaction when other students caused the rest of the class to lose their 10 minutes of free time? And as you might suspect, all of the kids kind of disliked the fact that this procedure was in place. They didn't like having their phones removed. Some of them did mention the fact that nobody else made them do this. So I could see how that also was skewed their results in that. Why am I doing this in this one class, but not in any other class? Most of the kids did state things like they felt it did help them focus better in class. They did better in class without their phones. And then really, I think the sweetest part of it was they did talk about how they, they got kind of frustrated when a, a student made them fail. Uh, and then they did an intervention group. So they all worked together and they talked about it. So if someone was using their phone, they all talked to that person about how they really needed to avoid using the phone. And if uh, a student needed help resisting the urge to use their phone, they'd hold their phone for them. Oh, that's uh, actually sweet. I mean, they reported it as sweet. Who knows if it was that sweet? They might have been like, if I still use your phone again, I'm going to grab it. I'm going to break it. And then you won't have yeah. it anyway. I mean, <laughs> they all sounded like it was a very sweet conversation that they had. So we will take them at their word in that regard. <laughs> Overall, really great results. I am fascinated that such high percentage of cell phone use and duration of cell phone use could drop so precipitously using such a, I mean, honestly, a lame intervention, 10 minutes of uninterrupted time. I and mean, I think I think we've seen that uninterrupted time of the reinforcer is often considered to be more quality reinforcement than, say, sporadic time with the reinforcer that mm -hmm. you may get told to stop at any minute. But I mean, if I were told, do you want 60 minutes in which I might tell you to stop and you have to stop for a little bit or just 10 minutes? 60 minutes is a lot bigger. I might take the 60 minutes. But in this case, it didn't seem to be the case. The yeah. researchers think this was a rule-governed behavior because yes. the results were so quick. That's what I was about to say. Yep. Oh, good. Good for you. Yeah, and I think there's also, I mean, kind of like, like a guilt component happening mm -hmm. there too, right? Mm -hmm. So prior to this point in time, everyone was just using their phone. They hadn't received any feedback regarding it. And then suddenly the teacher's saying, actually, there's a new rule in place now. You can't use your phone anymore. You get free time at the end. So now to use it is it's on the bad list. Yeah. yeah. Right? So mm -hmm. so now you're maybe there's an effort to please the teacher built into that as well that wasn't there before. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm that certainly that certainly could be. It was nice to see that the kids even though they didn't seem to love the intervention, having the intervention didn't seem to increase any sort of negative peer interactions. I think we'd seen that in another article related to the good behavior game where students actually said more positive statements about other student behavior than they did negative statements regarding, you know, failing and, you know, tanking the group for everyone or tanking the game for everyone. So that was good. Uh, the study listed a number of limitations. Certainly they wish they'd done different partial interval sampling. I think we all agree 90 minutes is a long partial interval. Mm -hmm. They didn't look at more individual duration performances. They really just said Veronica is sort of their test student. So, you know, that that's true. She used the most cell phone minutes. So if her results dropped so much, you would assume that the rest of the students would have dropped as well. There was a, some concern that when the students went to the bathroom, could it be possible that they were cheating and using their phone? However, only I think it was uh, less than 10 times, around 10 times that the students did go to the bathroom. So it didn't sound like even if the kids were using their phone in that setting, it was a significant amount of time sure. that you would you would worry about. But again, you know, I know a lot of times when you know, nowadays, you know, kids used to, you know, I, mean, I think we've all like, oh, I got to go to the bathroom. And we're really just going to the bathroom to sort of waste time or like yeah, go right. do something else for a while. Sure. I mean, I, I do hear about students who are like, they're gone for 20 minutes. There's no way they're using the bathroom for 20 minutes. So they're either, you know, doing something, they're probably doing something they shouldn't. There was also the fact that some days students didn't have the phones at all. You know, they found out after the fact there was a student who had their phone taken away by parents for a couple of days. So would that have skewed the results if some days the kids didn't have the phone? Again, probably not that much because anytime, you know, there were plenty of times when the score was 100% of students using their phone. So, you know, there were plenty of times when all the kids were using their phone. And there's also, and this was, I thought, an interesting point. Veronica was absent uh, more often during the intervention phase than the baseline phase. So there's the concern of, did Veronica use her phone so much that when she knew she couldn't use her phone, 
she actually ended up missing school or missing She's class. Really sick. You know, that, that's a worry that you might have a great system in place that decreases total cell phone use, but results in a lot of kids skipping class because they need to use their phone, quote unquote, need to use their phone so bad. So that, that might be a reality of having a system that sounds great, but can have some real difficulties for certain students. If only they'd taken more data. Well, they, you know, you know, they talked about that. Um, and then they also talked about, wouldn't it be nice since social validity was kind of grummy? Maybe we should have allowed the kids to choose their interventions after a while. Maybe get some yeah. concurrent chains yeah, up in great. there. Mm-hmm. That would have been awesome. And then also while the kids said, yes, it helped me do my work, they didn't actually measure if it did help the kids do their work any better. Right. There was no, and their grades that. went up from F's to A's. So they might have said, yeah, I felt like I could focus oh, and do my work. Professional photographers. Yeah, and, and they were all doing really terrible pictures. They didn't know how to develop film. What You know, who knows if, if there were improvements there. Uh, my other thought here, and this was not in the study, this was a great result and certainly a lot of directions. What if the class had been something really boring, like math or English or science? I'm not saying those are boring classes. Or critical. Yeah, but those are not electives. Everyone has to take those classes, and they tend to be ones that some percentage of students really, really hate. So what if you ran something like this in a class like that? Would you see the same results? Or would you see more differences between students because you've got some students who just, I hate this class and I'm not paying attention, so I don't care about winning the prize at the end. I'm going to use my cell phone because I just don't want to do any of the work in this class. You know, wh- wh- What were the results? Would you get the same results or not? Also, most classes aren't 90 minutes long, so you know, I'd love to see some modifications using, I think most classes are like about 40 to 50 minutes long, so maybe some modifications using the actual school schedule that I think most of us expect to see in a school. Yeah. So. A lot of room. Then 10% is only five minutes. So is that, does that feel like the same? And if you did 10 minutes, would teachers even agree to use this treatment? Because well, I only got 30 minutes to teach all yeah, this material. Not I'm not doing it. Yeah. yeah. So those would be two, two concerns that could come up with that. So a lot of fun research to do in this. So if you're interested in group contingencies and you don't like cell phones, well, you've got tons of research that you could be doing right now. Maybe I'll do it. I'd love to. I'd love class. to do that because I. I certainly one of the, the the issues that comes up a lot with older students is everyone's always using their devices, and it's hard to tell a teacher like, well, you have to tell them they can't use their device because no one's told the kid that, or if they have been, no one's followed through with it. So you know you're going to get a lot of pushback from the students, and if the first thing you do, like we talked about in coercion and it's followed, to say, hey everyone, I know you thought it was non contingent reinforcement on the phones. Turns out it never was, but I'm the first person to tell you I'm taking <laughs> all your phones away. <laughs> that's not going to be a pleasant class. I don't want to. I don't want to be there at the time. When that's my grab bag. Whoa! I thanks, hope Rob. you enjoyed it. I loved it. Good, because it was great. <laughs> Social validity was high. I'm wondering if we could rename grab bag grab barg so that it would be a palindrome. That what's a barg? Like a barge, but with no e on the end, in order mm-hmm. to make it a palindrome. You know what, Diana? Mm, That palindrome about bargs reminds me. If you are new to our show, or if you forgot, ABA Inside Track is ACE approved. By listening to our show, you can apply for continuing education credits. You just need to, you know, listen to the show, and then you can go to our website, abainsidetrack.com slash get hyphen CEUs. You're going to need to enter some information, though, including two secret code words that we've hidden throughout the episode. I'm going to give you the first code word right now, and it is horizon, H-O-R-I-Z-O-N, horizon. Like, what's that I see? Over the horizon. It's a grab bar. (laughs) Horizon. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Back to it. Who wants to go next? I'm going next. Go for it, Jaggy. Reach into the Reach into the barg. Oh, mine's right on top. Mine is from Behavior Analysis and Practice 2019 as well. Wow. And it is by Allie Good, Anderson, and McGee. It's entitled, I love it when people say entitled, (laughs) Casting a Wider Net, an Analysis of Scholarly Contributions of Behavior Analysis Graduate Program Faculty. Do you know any graduate program faculty? I do, myself. What? Uh huh. And wow. so that's why I was especially interested in this to see to see what's going on in the world of graduate program faculty and what they found out. And so this is, I think, an important important line of discussion. It's not necessarily research per se, 
It's more of a review of the literature uh, and what's going on in graduate program faculty. But this is really important because we all know that the field of behavior analysis is exploding. And so there are more and more behavior analysts coming into the field, passing the exam, going into training programs. Uh, and this is good for the field of behavior analysis, right? Because we're we're moving into un charted territories. But with this comes a bigger responsibility that all of these people need to be trained and should be coming from well-developed training programs. And it should be noted that the BACB does not specify if programs are good or well-developed. They specify that what the program does is they provide what's necessary in the syllabus. So when you're looking at uh, training mod modules, usually it's called a verified course sequence. Um, and so they're just saying, yes, we've looked at your syllabi and you're teaching your students what they need to be taught according to the total domain hours. Yeah. We um, covered all the content areas. Right. And so there is an accrediting body. ABAI does accredit master's programs and they look at the training module or the training module, mentoring practices, attrition rate, post graduation employment. However, out of the 250 VCSs that are available for students, only 20 programs are accredited. So that's kind of hard if you're, you know, if you're looking for a good program. And it may be that other programs are good, they're just not accredited yet for various reasons. I thought it was interesting that there's only 250 VCSs available. I thought that would be much higher. Oh, yeah? I don't know. There's, like, programs popping up all over the place. Mm. So I was surprised that there's only 250 in and out of the United States. Mm -hmm. That just seems like not a ton. Yeah. But it's probably going to get bigger. And so, really, without the accreditation process, where only 20 of them are being accredited by the ABAI status, we don't really have a lot to say whether the program is is a good program for students except for the pass rate that's available. And if you have a lower year where you have fewer students, it may not even um, mm -hmm. show up on the BACB pass rate. And so there's been discussion on how, you know, how students can look at programs without looking just at the pass rate and trying to figure out if there's a program that would be good for them in one way that other colleagues have suggested this may be a possibility is looking at faculty productivity. So in a previous review by Dixon and colleagues in 2015, they looked at 74 graduate programs that offered a VCS and reviewed peer review publications across six behavior analytic journals published by ABAI and SEAB. Um, the Society of Experimental Analysis of Behavior, and found that only 67% of faculty and training programs produce 10 or fewer articles, which is not a lot. And 14 programs had no publications whatsoever, so they were slightly concerned about faculty productivity um, across programs. Wilder and colleagues also extended this review in 2015, but only included... Uh, articles from 2000 to 2014 so that those newer programs could have a chance, right? So if you've yeah. only been a program for a few years, it's going to be harder for you to, you know, be online with programs that have been for a while for a long time. And they use three similar journals as the Dixon, and then they use other, journal, other journals that focused on ABA-specific practical research. And so here the study author had to be affiliated to the university that they were in. And one thing that these cur the current authors, Allie Good and colleagues, suggested for here is that these reviews leave out behavior analysts that are publishing outside of the field mm -hmm. of behavior analysis, right? Or outside of these, you know, very limited journals that these authors chose. And we're missing if they're publishing interdisciplinary research mm -hmm. or disseminating in larger journals that may have more impact. Yeah. So what they wanted to do is do uh, an extension of the two previous reviews and look at programs that were not accredited by ABAI because they said those are already of high quality, like the ABI has determined that they're good programs, so why include them in this bunch? They also wanted to include articles from 2000 to 2015, and they used all peer-reviewed publications indexed in psych info database and not just the behavior analytic ones mm -hmm. so that we could see where are VCS instructors. So that's all the instructors labeled in a program. Where are they publishing? Mm -hmm. 
So that's kind of like neat. Sounds like a fun project. Right? <laughs> yeah. So here they're looking at the range of scholar journals and not necessarily the quality, right? So mm-hmm. they could be behavioral analytic or not. So first what they did is they obtained all of the VCS instructor lists from the BACB. And if an instructor was affiliated with multiple VCSs, each VCS got a count for that. So, right, because they that's only fair. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so they excluded books, books, chapters, dissertations, and non-peer-reviewed periodicals. And they, again, didn't filter whether it was behavior analytic or not. So what they found is they had a total of 1,232 instructors across 224 programs. And so what they found is that these instructors are publishing in 715 peer-reviewed journals. uh, And mostly one instructor is publishing across journals, right, with two to four publishing in multiple journals. Uh, And what they found is that of the 224 programs, 199 of them, so that's 90%, had at least one instructor with at least one publication. Oh, okay. So that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So if you're looking at, are you doing research? Maybe, right? And at least one person is working on doing research. Um, So here they said the median number of publications was 16. What's the median again? It's, you take the numbers, you put them all in a row. It's the middle one. Yeah, it's the middle one. Okay. And and then the mean number of faculty per program was four. So that will, if someone has more or less, that's Mm going to matter. And then. about the mode? The mode was two. Oh, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. That's the number that occurs most often. Okay, thank you. Again, math. I knew the mode, actually. I couldn't remember the median, but I did know the mean, so I'm winning. So of those 199 programs, 44 programs had only one instructor publishing, and five of them had only one instructor listed. So Mm. they were were like, I hope you're not teaching all of the classes, but maybe you are. And 127 had fewer than 50% of instructors, instructors published. And so then, out of... All of those instructors, 741 of them had one or more publication, and out of those, 356 had published in the ABI or the SEAB journal. So the mean there was 12, the median was 6, and the mode was 1. Do they look at time, Jackie? Like, oh, well, I published something 20 years ago. So and it was I haven't between published 2000 and 2015. So it was, oh, it's just within that range. Yep. Okay. Just that range of time. Gotcha. Yeah. So they give us just. But they didn't care if, if like, I published something in 2001 and I've been not teaching. Again. Okay. Yeah. And so here they say. This is actually more promising than what Dixon had found because he said only 60%, 67% of faculty were, were publishing. So that was fairly low. And they had ranked a top 10 list of universities that had like the best, the best publishing rates across each of the various categories, Java or behavior analysis and practice or, or whatnot, where they're saying that it's actually a lot more promising than that because behavior analysts are not just publishing in these specific journals there there's a wide range of journals and the nice thing about this article is they give you every single one of the journals that mm-hmm. they're publishing 10 instructors were publishing in the journal of vocational rehabilitation 15 of the instructors were publishing in the journal of early intervention so they give you all oh, there's a lot with the most obviously instructors 260 instructors publishing in the journal of applied behavior analysis mm-hmm. um, so they give you a really nice table of all of that so am I understanding it right that there's 715 different journals? What in the world could those be? Oh, no. Number of journals, three, 400. 350 is the highest on this table. Yeah, that, I, I, I'm looking at the figure, too, when I oh. can't make sense of it. Figure 2. Hold on. No, no. I'm looking at the figure also. <laughs> oh. So number of instructors publishing. Like two to four instructors are publishing in a variety of journals. Five to nine. One instructor published in 350 no, no, different no. journals? For each program, at least one instructor had published across journals. So remember, there was 1,200 instructors. This one is looking at instructors, not journals. But it says graduate-level VCS instructors published in 715 peer-reviewed journals. Total. But so the, it could like be... a cr- doubling up? Right? No, it could be, it could be across all... It doesn't have to be behavior analytic. 
Remember? Because it could be the Journal of Rehabilitation or Speech and Language Pathology. Is your point that that's a crazy amount of jur- total yes. journals? Yes. That does sound like more so, journals. Because we have, I don't know, 15 in our field. Right. So there's 700 other journals that would accept behavior analytic research? I hope so. Right? But it might not be behavior analytic. Right? That was one of the, th- the catch-offs. Could be cross-disciplinary. It could be cross-disciplinary. It could be not behavior analytic, but published by someone that's a behavior analyst. I mean, education probably has at least 15. I would assume education has even more more peer-reviewed journals, and a lot of the work done in behavior analysis would apply to those. Right. And that's one of their discussion points, is that it seems like, if you look at this, a lot of people are publishing outside of the box. So that could be promising, or not. So they're like, it could be promising because it's another way that we're disseminating behavior analysis across yeah, every, that's good. every discipline. Or some crap ass journals and they'll take anything. <laughs> or the sad fact is it could be that VCS instructors are publishing but are not publishing behavior analytic work. Right? Because we don't Whoa. know. That right? would be. We don't know. What are they doing? How would you have time to teach your VCS work and other research related to something totally different? But they don't know because they didn't look, right? So they said all, like anyone that's got an instructor, all those 1,200 instructors. So so the percentage of VCS instructors that publish is much better than originally thought. Right. However. But we don't know what they're publishing. What does that mean? That's a number. It's a quantity. The quantity is better. Doesn't mean the quality is is necessarily better. Yeah. So we don't know. And it could, remember, it could double account. So if an instructor is affiliated or working under multiple VCSs, each one of those VCSs gets gets a point. Right? I, I also want to bring up the fact that, you know, I think pass rate, just looking at pass rate, like the article stated, is not necessarily the best way to rate a program. Mm-hmm. But the fact that, oh, I'm in a program where the instructors have published so many journal articles, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good program either. Because right. I remember plenty of professors undergrad who were like, oh, they've published so many things. And they sucked. And I hated their class and I never went. Right. And so this is one of the discussion points too, is this is this one factor, right? And it may be that if you're publishing that you're really familiar and intimate with the research. But that also might mean that your position may not be solely focused on doing research. It may be focused on teaching, which means that you're getting more high quality yeah. teaching and less because you're teaching all the time, you're less likely to be doing research. Uh, it doesn't mean that a lower publication rate doesn't mean lower quality, right? It just depends on where where you're supposed to allocate your time according to your job. And I want to make it clear, that was some undergrad professors, any graduate professors, some of whom might listen to the show, were always fabulous, no matter how much research <laughs> they did or did not publish. But I think that's actually really important to note, too, because at a lot of bigger universities, you may only teach two classes and then have 50% of your time to dedicate yep. to research and have an active research lab, whereas at other universities, you may be teaching a 4-4, research, a 4-4 teaching load where research is something you do on your own time yeah. when you're having fun, right? So you have to be doing something. Uh, it's nice. I'd love to go to the program that has a great pass rate and all the instructors do a ton of research, but I'd also like to know that they're good professors. I mean, there are, there are right. a lot of factors. So yeah. this is one. It's nice. Right. It's and interesting. S- and what they said is uh, Dixon and colleagues found that there was a positive correlation between passing the exam and more publication. But what they did say is passing the exam is not predictive of, of practical competency. Right. So That's true. And doing research is not predictive <laughs> of practical competency. We all know competency. somebody who passed the exam. We're like, how did that happen? So in here, every field, right? Just everyone else. Yeah. So what they what the authors discussed here is that productivity here. So if you're looking at a lot of faculty that are publishing a lot, that just might mean that students may have more exposure to active research during their graduate training. May have exposure to conducting research studies, reading literature reviews, reading studies, and this may help with consumption of literature and help with being able to critically analyze articles in their everyday job. So they, I love that the end point is like research is just one feature of a program. And right now we don't really have a good way to, except for the ABI accreditation, to decide whether a program is, you know, rigorous or Mm -hmm. not. So they said that students should really ask about graduation rates, employment rates, number of practicum opportunities, program size, funding, mentors, research. Oh, that's like the U.S. News and World yeah. Report <laughs> listing. Yeah, like and, and other measurable features that are important to you. Like uh, if you like small class sizes, maybe that's 
something mm-hmm. that you'll want to do, or how the classes are held. That's something that you should What's look at. What's the party environment like right. in some of these classes? <laughs> Can we use our phone? <laughs> um, but I, I really like that this, this article was conducted, too, because I think it just lends a more broader discussion on how can you evaluate these graduate programs yeah. and not solely on faculty productivity alone because there's more than than that in a in a graduate program. That's interesting. And I, and I would imagine 99% of BCBAs have never thought about this because they went to a program for whatever reason and now they don't think about it anymore because they're not in a program. It would only really be prospective students and the professors and leaders in the field that probably would ever think about. Right. And I wonder what, I mean, wonder what students think about. They They think about, you know... They look at the pass rate. They look at what their friends have gone to, right? Mm -hmm. They're asking online suggestions. A lot of that. Yep, where they know. So I'm, I'm wonder if they're even looking at whether, oh, who publishes here, right? I'm wondering that. I mean, I interview a lot of students, and that is rarely a question that I Mm -hmm. get. Like, oh, what's your, what's your productivity rate? I should ask them that. I should be like, didn't you want to know my productivity rate before you (laughs) left? I don't know what that is. Right? I'll be like, it's. I need it's to okay. go now. <laughs> it's not great, but it's okay. It's not as good as. Could always be better, people, you know. Right? Like, like your cholesterol. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I gotta get up earlier. But I just, I like this. I like this, and it was helpful for me. And I think it's a, a good discussion to think about for you know students of behavior analysis. If you're thinking about going into a master's program, this just if you read this, it might give you some more thoughts into the programs that you're choosing. And to think about who was going to be teaching you. But I just like that. But yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Jackie, thank you very much for your grab bag article. Diana. That's cool. We got one more to go. Okay. But let's take a little break. Then we'll come back and reach back into that grab bag one last time. We'll be right back. be a bcba sure we all do now you can come to regis college in weston mass to get your graduate degree choose from any one of these courses masters of science in applied behavior analysis masters of science in special education dual degree in special ed and aba or be eligible for your post master certificate you can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu. Regiscollege.edu. One more time www.regiscollege.edu. See you there! And we're back with one more article to go in our eighth grab bag. All right, Tyna, it's your turn. So I need you to reach into the bag. Okay. Find an article that will hopefully be interesting to discuss. All right, I got one. What's it called? It is called Manned Acquisition Across Different Teaching Methodologies. And that is by Russell and Reinecke. It's from Behavioral Interventions 2019. Awesome. Yeah. Wow, we're all skimming the top this time. Only recent. Yeah, yeah, we re- we went chronological. We printed the articles from the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. We just didn't reach very deep. You into know, the bag. If you do a cross section of the bar, it's yeah. like, you know, you can, you can just see time passing. What, like sedimentary rock? Just like sedimentary rock. Nice. Yeah, we, we didn't reach very deep. It's a really big bag. It's gotten bigger. Every year it gets bigger. Right, exactly. And my arms aren't really that long. So, no. And I just reached into the top and I found this article, but I'm excited to talk about it because right. the question that they're asking in this article is one that I think often comes up when you're teaching young learners. Uh, to request items is how is the best way to teach manding? Should I create sort of naturalistic opportunities and allow the presence uh, of the MO to serve as the discriminative stimulus for manding? Or should I introduce an external 
stimulus prompt such as the question, what do you want, in order to help facilitate the response. I love this because I always just do a go-to but never actually know what I'm doing. Yeah, I've always taught to not say, what do you want, as the SD, because I can interfere with the establishment of the MO is the best method to evoke the response. Oh, that's good. Yeah, you're right. right. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, I hadn't actually read research on it. It had just come to me through sort of handed down best practice mm-hmm. regarding specifically like incidental and naturalistic teaching. I can't believe you didn't ask yourself that question and look. Well, I thought, well, that makes sense, right? Yeah, but right. one should not just base what you do on whether it makes sense or not because it's sure. not always the best way. Yeah. You should go in there and research. So that's what these authors did. Nice. And... There have been some other previous studies that have tackled this question as well. So one that they brought up specifically was Sweeney Kerwin et al. They worked to teach man's under specifically the context of the MO. And they did so by initially having the item present, teaching the man in that capacity, and then fading out the item on a time delay such that the item was no longer present when the man was evoked. That's clever. Which is, which is a nice tactic as well because the concern with having an item present is you never fully know if saying I want water when you have the water bottle there is really manned for water or tacting of the water bottle. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. So it could be a little bit impure. So they, they went to those lengths, which was really nice to see. This study kind of took it in a different direction and said the question I already stated, should we work on it from that capacity where we're – establishing the MO and allowing that to evoke the response or using an SD, like, what do you want? You okay. still hear what do you want all the time. You do. Right? Yep. And it's usually like this, what do you want? Yeah, right. I 100% see the concern there because we don't want to kind of like override the potential MO by introducing this question that's going to then serve as a determinative stimulus for access to the potentially reinforcing item because that's a – skill in and of itself but it's a totally different skill than looking around saying i haven't had any water in a long time right. internally looking around not seeing a water bottle and yet still saying i want, I want water. some water mm-hmm. in this study they wanted to make a comparison between teaching using man training and teaching using discrete trial training in which there was an sd present to determine if one of those methods produced more independent man's following training. They had two participants in the study, both of whom were diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder. Anna was seven years old and Philip was four years old. They were both level one learners on the VB map, which means that manning was an appropriate skill for them to learn as they did not engage in that independently. Before things really got rolling, they did an MSWO and through that process established two highly preferred items in both the leisure category and the edible category for Anna and Philip. They then did a baseline in which they just waited to see if they independently mm-hmm. managed her items. They did not. So that would say that this is an appropriate thing to work on. I hope that they use the expectant eye gaze because it's my most favorite. They might have. Yeah. Ooh. Or you just Ooh. wait <laughs> and you look ready. Uh, so they may, they may have done that. They did not particularly specify. Then they assigned the varying items to either the man training category or the discrete trial training category. In both categories, they use the same prompting procedure. And that was, uh, I'll describe it in more detail, but it was least the most prompting. And then they use a six second delay Mm. as well, because that was what Sweeney Kerwin had used previously. So they started things off with a five minute independent probe in which no prompting was provided. And they basically waited to see if they manned it independently. This was without an item present. Okay. Okay, so that's the part where you're trying to determine... Pure manned. Pure manned. I love that. Without the item present. Pure. So pure. Pure as a driven snow. Every time I think of that, I think of that 80s song. It's like, duh. You know what I'm talking about. 100% pure love? No, I love that one, but it's like... White Wedding? No. Guys, it's on the... It's like Enigma. It's like, ah. It's on the commercial of like 80s top pop, and it's like... Cindy Lauper's good enough. Never mind. From the Goonies. I'll find it. Boys to Men. No, Enigma. I don't know them. <laughs> Is that a real band? Yes. She's looking it up. 
You're thinking of that song. M O is it me you're looking for? <laughs> nice. Every time you say pure, oh, it's pure it's love. Oh, it's a return to innocence. Yeah, is that one? Because it was on. <laughs> on the pure love soundtrack Shh. it's a return to innocence <laughs> okay sorry <laughs> I, I actually don't know that again. I don't know any of that We're gonna listen to I that don't again. know that reference <laughs> who am I I don't know that reference me <laughs> <laughs> sorry <Jenny>. boom <laughs> okay so if they did not man after the five minute independent probe then they presented the item in both conditions, okay? Uh, once the item was present, they waited for some level of interest by the participant by reaching for the item or looking at the item or something so that they were like, well, we think the EO is present. In the manning condition, once that like move towards the item happened, then they provided an echoic prompt. In the DTT condition, once that manning towards the item happened, they added in an SD of, what do you want? And then provided a collect prompts as needed following. Okay, so they trained those in both of those settings. Once responding occurred at strength, or according to mastery criterion, I guess, really. And at least one, I'll tell you what happened more specifically, but once they met my mastery criterion, then they moved on to a generalization slash maintenance phase in which uh, there were new teachers present, and they were also doing some natural, more naturalistic probes. As well, and then they did maintenance slash follow-up after one month, too. The bottom line here, guys, is that we only had two participants, and things were a little bit mixed, is what they found. Mm -hmm. So let me walk you through. I love their their items. Gusher candy. Cotton candy. Oh, yeah. I forgot to tell you what they like. Moon sand. Artificial snow. It's like a Hallmark movie. Way Don't eat happen. all of those. So those are not for eating. Yeah. Bee toy. Mike and I candy. Gusher candy. Those are Phillips. Bee toy and flashlight. And then Anna liked cotton candy. Doritos. There you go, Rob. What kind of Doritos? It doesn't specify. Cool American Doritos? No, probably Cool Ranch. Cool Cool American is Cool Ranch. Only in Australia, I think. Only. Well, I think in America, it's Cool Ranch. Everywhere in the world, it is now Cool Ranch. There's a period of time in which there were at least two countries, of which I think Australia was one, where they called them Cool American. Because they're like cowboy chips? Yeah, we, like ranch might not mean anything. Although it would in Australia, so I don't know. Maybe it's not Australia. But cool American is how they would refer to them. Because ranch, like a cowboy, which would be American. Although there were cowboys in other places in the world. A cool American is a better title for your chip name. It is, totally. And the blue chips are better than the red chips. Yep. Hands down. Yeah. Uh, Anna also likes sand and, and the artificial snow, which I don't like that stuff. It has a very weird plasticky feeling to I it, agree. but I guess she yeah. was into it, which is fine. She she can be. <laughs> Her choice. One other amazing thing about the graph is somebody screwed up because the chart area bar is still in the graph uh, in the PDF. Oh, yeah. Chart area. Somebody messed up. I hope somebody lost their job well. over this. Yeah. It's terrible. <laughs> That's how it happens when you cut and paste it in. Yep, that's what happens when you cut and paste it in. <laughs> anyway, the graph that I really liked was the line graph, okay. more so than the bar graph. Sure. So that's figure one for anyone who's following along, not while you're driving, certainly. Oh, I'm sorry. I also forgot to tell you it's a multiple baseline across participants design as well as an alternating treatments design across conditions. Ooh, so much functional control. <laughs> Kind of, <laughs> I'll tell you. Uh, so Anna and Philip, uh, in baseline, neither of them manded for any of the items independently. And that's really what we were tracking here on our y-axis was frequency of independent mans. They then assigned some of the items to the set one condition and some to the set two condition. The set one condition was the man training and the set two was discrete trial training. Here we saw differing types of responding for each participant. So Anna demonstrated a higher frequency of independent mans in the manned training condition. However, she displayed little to no manding at all in the discrete trial training condition. That's disheartening. Yeah, it just didn't happen. They did not see that occur. Yeah. So then what they did for her is that they moved to the moved the discrete trial set to a best practice condition in which they started using man training to teach that. And then they saw responding increase, hmm. although not to levels quite as high uh, as the first set, but there may have been differences, perhaps in her preference for some of the items. Now, for Philip, he 
manded in both conditions, regardless. They then did a reversal for him as well, and responding really did not change too much in that condition. The generalization condition, they also at some points called it generalization, and at some points called it NET, which I will not lie, I found a tiny bit confusing. Mm. Yeah, it's a little bit confusing. Yeah. Right? So yeah. it's sort of like, let's probe these in the natural environment and see if they occur, as well as some other items that were untrained. Let's see if those occur, too. And here... The point to take away here is that they really saw some divergent patterns in responding across the two participants. So for Anna, the way that they describe it is we really saw her learn how to mand. So in these NET conditions, it didn't it no longer mattered like how the items were trained necessarily, but if the MO was present, then she manded for the item, which is exactly what you want to see. That's the whole goal of man training, is that when you need or want something, you ask for it, regardless of whether someone presents particular SD to you, right? So it should be under the control of the motivating operation in and of itself. Now for Philip, they continue to see his responding occur predominantly when the SD, what do you want, was presented. And while he had better maintenance and generalization of his responding, it was pretty much only underneath the control of the SD. So it's a very different pattern of responding, right? His response did not occur related to the motivating operation, but rather to someone else asking, what do you want? Which is always the concern, which is why we say, let's not teach it that way. So while his acquisition data looked like, oh, wow, he's learning across both conditions, what they really saw long term for him is that the SD was more controlling his response than the MO. And then they kind of found the opposite results for Anna that the MO was really controlling her response overall. So the bottom line takeaway here for me is that, well, there's a couple. We need to do more in this area. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Because there was only two participants in the study, and I want to know more to see if these two patterns are consistent across more individuals if one of them was like a fluke type of response just with two you can't see a pattern there mm. right all we know is that they had idiosyncratic responses here uh, and then the other takeaway from me is if you're worried about the sd uh, producing a false sense of control and sort of overriding the mo which is what you really want to control the, the behavior then don't present the sd of what do you want when teaching manding which is mm -hmm. kind of where I started with the whole thing and kind of where I'm ending up with the whole thing. So I feel continue to feel comfortable in my recommendation, but I would still like a little more research to back it up if someone wanted to know why I'm saying that. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. But I'm really glad they did this study because yeah. I think it's important to look at it and try to tease it apart. I just uh, think that it should be done a little bit more so we know for with more certainty. I wonder what the time constraints were. I always wonder, is it like the research time constraints mm -hmm. or is it the student time constraints somebody was getting married and they had to finish their research <laughs> no i just so always it's end of the year right and i just always like to know i like it when they're like specific about what the time constraint is because then i feel better about them not like continuing mm -hmm. right like why didn't they wait and for a third participant we're just getting so tired of this research we just want to be done with it <laughs> Yeah, like they're like, right. due to us being annoyed. But I don't think that was it. But, you know, like, I just like knowing when they say due to time constraints, I like to know what the time constraints yeah. are. Maybe because I'm nosy. But <laughs> you uh -huh. think so? They had to get back to listening to their 100% pure love CD. <laughs> right. And they didn't like, know any more time. <gasps> Boom. <wow. laughs> right. And they only did the one maintenance point, which was right. a month later, but it was right. still only one point. Yeah. But I bet it was the end of the year. That's almost always yeah. what it is. The end of someone's year. <laughs> Either a yeah. graduate student's year. Right. Or a student's year. Yeah. I always just like knowing that. I all love the studies. We read one recently, right, the, that they looked – well, I read one recently. They looked at something across three years. They yeah. looked, looked at maintenance across three years. Like, they're like, oh, look, we went through one school year, then a second school year, mm -hmm. and then a third school year. Those people – had a lot of time. Yeah, on that was Duran and Carr, 1991. Yeah, that was amazing. Yeah, FCT, yeah. maintenance and generalization, long term. So I just love that. Like they were like, That's we've devotion. got. We've, they're like, we've got all the time in the world. <laughs> we can wait. Yeah, we're, we're waiting. <laughs> they went into that knowing that it was going to be a long time. All right. Well, thank you so much, Diana. And I guess that brings sure. us to the end of the show. 
We will not be doing our dissemination station segment on tonight's episode because with Grab Bag, it's kind of hard to say what's the central thesis and take home point for three articles that were completely unrelated to one another. So I guess we'll just leave you with the thought that there's so much research out there. But unfortunately, if you'd like to reach into our grab bag, you can't because like we always do. It now gonna... contains 715 journals. Yep, we got to look through all these journals. We gotta, we're so going to get rid bigger. of this. We usually set the whole thing on fire, <laughs> you know, but it's hot out. So we're just going to throw it in a lake uh, and we'll let the fish have all the articles. Then we'll print them all out again next time around. Before we wrap up, though, I want to make sure you get our second secret code word. It is sail, S-A-I-L. Like, I'm going to sail on a boat. Across the sea. Sail across a sea. There's a sail on that dinosaur. That's the one way to say it, right? A Demetrodon, yes. Yes, sail. Well, we hope you enjoyed listening to ABA Inside Track. Our podcast comes out every week. Why not subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts? Feel free to leave us a review. If you'd like to otherwise get in touch with us, there are a lot of ways you can do that. You can certainly go to our website, abainsidetrack.com. You can find us on social media. We're everywhere. Pinterest. We're on Twitter, Facebook. We're on Instagram. All is ABA Inside Track. We even have a YouTube page, ABA Inside Track on Twitter. YouTube. I don't know the exact page. <laughs> That's what it is. YouTube.com. <laughs> Something like that. And of course, you can always feel free to email us at any point with corrections, thoughts, topic ideas at ABA Inside Track at gmail.com. And finally, thanks to Kyle Sturry for our great interstitial theme song. We'll be back next week with another full length episode. But until then, keep responding. Bye. Bye. Ahoy, ahoy.